everybody, I'm KC, and welcome to an edition of Let's Talk About, and welcome to the latest installment of To Infinity War and Beyond. And now it's time to return to a world of Norse gods and spaceships in Thor the Dark World. Thousands of years ago, Asgard fought the Dark Elves to gain possession of the Aether, a magical relic that can plunge the realms into eternal darkness and was sealed away for millennia until when the planet align, blah blah blah, ancient magical prophecy stuff, you know the drill. When the Aether appears again, Thor must defend the Nine Realms and those closest to him from the Dark Elf Malekith, played by Christopher Eccleston? Well, that explains the accents. If you are an alien, how comes you sound like you're from the north? Lots of planets have a north. Thor the Dark World is an interesting entry for me because it was the kind of story I thought I was going to get with the first movie after meeting Thor and the Avengers. And even though you could argue the first one is the stronger film, especially from a character standpoint, I kind of like this one better. For one, it's nice to actually see more of Thor's world. Asgard still looks marvelous, and even seeing glimpses of the other civilizations of the Nine Realms is really cool. Thor's first appearance in Vanaheim is probably the best example of how well this franchise can blend alien concepts with Norse mythology and still make it look dignified. I especially love the design of the Dark Elf ships. They're almost like giant swords floating in the sky. It's so awesome. I did hear some criticism about the look of the Dark Elf's world Sfar- Sfar- Sfardolf- uh, Yeah, I have no clue. Sure, it wasn't a very dark world, but I thought it was very atmospheric. It has such a gloomy, almost sick look to it, like a world that's just been left to rot, and it's done in a pretty minimalist way. And I even appreciated how they framed the end credit scene. It is as mysterious as most of the others, but actually naming the Infinity Stones let me Google them as soon as the movie ended and discover what intriguing items they were. It made me even more determined not to miss a single movie, which is what the end credit scene should do. But the world building isn't perfect, Case in point, how is the Bifrost fixed? Did I miss something? Is it just common Marvel knowledge that the gateway to the realms is just really easy to glue back together? Maybe I'm making too big a deal about it, but it just makes the sacrifice at the end of the first movie feel kind of meaningless when it can be repaired with no apparent difficulty. The overall plot and the legend behind the Aether is pretty generic, I think we can all agree on that, but my stance is that if you can make a very typical plot entertaining, you pass. And I was personally entertained by this adventure, but I can definitely see why some might think it's a bit too stock fantasy. From a character standpoint, it was kind of interesting to me to see Thor's new attitude front and center in a movie that focuses on him. He's more humble and respectful, but there is still a bit of pride in there, just mostly in showing proper dominance or celebrating a victory. Thor's intro into the movie is a pretty great way to understand his basic character in about a minute. While the first movie was a coming of age story, this one has Thor wondering what to do next. His worldview has changed so much that it doesn't really align with the kind of king Odin wants him to be, and the affection he has towards Earth and Jane is still fresh in his mind. So Thor is not only fighting for the fate of the Nine Realms, but two worlds that he loves but has to choose between. And the decision he makes at the end isn't a good thing or a bad thing, it's just what he has to do. And something I noticed was that Thor and Odin's fight over how to deal with Malekith after he kills Frigga is something of a parallel to their fight about the Frost Giants in the first movie. Only this time, Thor actually thinks his actions through and actually has something resembling a plan. It's it's a pretty out there plan, but still, it's a strategy, which was a foreign concept to him on Jotunheim, and he does this to save the lives of his fellow Asgardians who Odin was going to put in harm's way on the vague hope that they would be enough to stop Malekith. Continuing the ongoing theme in the series that Odin is not exactly father of the year. You can get mad all you want, Hannibal, but it's your fault your kids are like this. As for Thor's friends on Earth, Darcy is still annoying and in the movie even more now, but at least she's being a little proactive, like actually trying to contact Shield. Old. It's a start. But am I the only one who thought it was weird that the comedic sidekick got her own comedic sidekick? Why is he here? And while Selvig's appearances are hit or miss, the first time we see him is definitely a miss, I kind of like the idea that he's become more aware of spatial distortions and even became a little unhinged after being brainwashed by Loki. Following through on the events of the Avengers in a meaningful way is always a plus in my book. And Jane? <sighs> okay. 
In the first and third act, Jane is fine. I liked her just as much as I did in the last movie, and I really like that she played a major role in the climax instead of getting left behind. But after getting the Aether trapped inside her and Thor takes her to Asgard, she basically becomes window dressing. Which is weird, because every character on Asgard gets a chance to contribute to the fight in some form. It just bothered me that someone who was so spirited and determined and even a bit clever just kind of became a living MacGuffin. There's this great moment when she first arrives where she geeks out over the Asgardian technology. That's a quantum field generator, isn't it? It's a soul forge. Does the soul forge transfer molecular energy from one place to another? Yes. It's really endearing and fits perfectly for her character. I really wish we'd seen more of that. Maybe have her admire more of Asgardian culture or study the Aether on her own. There's even a deleted scene where she does something like that and why it was cut, I have no clue. Or hell, maybe use her astrophysicist skills to help find a way out of Asgard in the second act, instead of just sitting there doing nothing. Bringing Jane to Asgard was a great idea, but I just wish they'd done more with it. Also, there's kind of a love triangle between her her, Thor, and Lady Sif. I don't really know why, but they don't really do anything with it, so who cares? But who cares about Thor and Jane and all those other people? The one we all came to see is Loki. Apparently Loki was barely supposed to be in this movie, but after test screenings complained about the lack of Loki, they made him a more essential part of the story. Lesson here? Never underestimate the power of fangirls. Of course, Loki is answering for what he did in New York, and he brought the Whedon-esque sarcastic charm he gained in the Avengers back with him. No shock, Loki is easily the best thing in the movie. Treading the line of good and evil from leading invaders right to their target for the heck of it, to being genuinely struck with grief over the murder of his adopted mother. It was short, but I love the connection they established between them. It's a link to Loki's humanity that I appreciate. But even though he mourns his mother and helps Thor find Malekith, he's not giving up his desire to rule, even contributing to the mid-movie twist that I genuinely fell for the first time I saw this because I didn't know how popular Loki was back then, just to get to the throne. And he might have succeeded, I think? I don't know, I still haven't seen Ragnarok yet. You know, dude, if you really want a bunch of people to admire you unconditionally, you could have saved yourself a bunch of time and collateral damage and just conquer Comic-Con. There's really not much to say about Malekith. Eggleston plays the part well, and I do love the look, but he doesn't have any motives or distinctive characteristics outside of plunge the world into eternal darkness because he feels like it. He's not a good character, but I will give him points for being a threatening villain. Like I've said, sometimes it's all you need. And he contributes to one of the most entertaining final battles in the MCU. I love the Thor and Malekith fight while being transported to different worlds and different locations and affecting the other characters and objects around them. They came up with a cool concept and they really ran with it. I don't really have anything analytical to say about it. It was just fun and I loved it and it was hands down the best action scene in the movie which is good. Go out on top. Overall, Thor The Dark World is a movie I had a lot of fun with, even though it's probably not that great. This may make me sound like a hypocrite after the last video, but I think Thor The Dark World does enough right to really enjoy it. It doesn't focus on the characters as much as its predecessor, but it puts them through new challenges and follows through on them. The story's simple, but that just lets them have more fun with it. I had fun with this movie, and that's about it. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you guys next time.